good evening. In the sky at night, this is the last time we shall be saying very much about Halley's Comet, at least until about the year 2060, and by which time I think you'll almost certainly have another presenter. I hope you enjoyed our program from Darmstadt, when the Giotto probe actually went through the comet. You know, when we went on the air, no one had very much idea of what was going to happen, least of all me. But we did get some very interesting results and some surprises too. And here's one of the best pictures of the nucleus sent back by the camera. Of course, it's a false color picture, you understand. And the nucleus itself is up there to the left. And you will notice it is dark. And that was a real surprise. We'd expected the nucleus to be bright and icy. Instead of which, as was said by Dr. Keller, the head of the camera team, it's as black as black velvet. So quite clearly, there's an unexpectedly thick layer of darkish material overlying the dirty ice ball underneath. And as Dr. Keller also said, uh, the ice ball is probably more dirt than ice. Well, Giotto, I'm glad to say, did survive. It had a very rough ride, and the equipment was very badly damaged, but some of the experiments may be still partly functional. And we may not have heard the last of Giotto yet, because it's on its way back, and it should be put into an Earth orbit around about 1990, at a distance of something like 400,000 kilometers. As to what happens then, well, everything depends upon how badly damaged it is. There was a plan to send it on to rendezvous with another smaller comet, although whether this is going to be possible, I don't yet know. We simply got to wait and see. But at any rate, even if Giotto does nothing more, there's no doubt whatever it has been an outstanding success. And yet, you know, I still have letters from people who complain bitterly they either didn't see Halley's Comet or didn't see it at all well. I quite agree that from here, it never was spectacular. It was just about visible with the naked eye, but not very much more than that. And at the moment, you can't see it from here at all. It's too far south. But now, from the southern hemisphere, it is quite a sight. I was down south last week, and there's a drawing I made of the comet. And you can see there the bright head, or coma, which conceals the dark nucleus, and a long, imposing tail stretching away from it. And in point of fact, the comet is now getting closer to the Earth, and it will be at its very best on April the 10th, when it'll be only just under 40 million miles away from us and should be quite a sight. But still, sadly, it's going to be too far south to be seen from here, and it won't again rise above our horizon until about April the 26th. And by then, I'm afraid it will have faded so much that it may no longer be visible with the naked eye, and I think you'll probably need binoculars to see it. But it will be there, and with binoculars, it should be a very easy object, possibly with quite a considerable tail. And it's going to be near the little constellation of Corvus the Crow. So let's find Corvus. Begin, as we so often do, with Ursa Major, the great player, the plough, whatever you call it, which is easy to find. Follow around the bear's tail, and you come first of all to the bright orange star Arcturus. Follow the curve still further, and you come to Spica in Virgo the Virgin, which I have more to say about a bit later on. Now, Corvus is near Spica and a bit lower down. The four main stars of Corvus make up a quadrilateral. They are not particularly bright. They are not so bright as the pole star, but they are conspicuous because they are rather isolated, and they do make up a distinctive pattern. And I don't think you'll have any problem in finding it. And on April the 26th, when it comes back into view, the comet is going to be there. So if you find Corvus and sweep along with binoculars, I think you should see the comet with no trouble at all. It'll then move up to the constellation of Crater, the cup, and on May the 1st, it's going to be in the same binocular field with the fourth magnitude star, Alces or Alpha Craterus. And it'll then go on moving north and fading as it goes. And in late May, the moon's going to become very obtrusive again, and I think that's going to be your last chance of seeing the comet with binoculars. After that, you'll need a telescope, and it's going to get steadily and quite quickly fainter and fainter as it moves away from the sun and away from the Earth. I think, with the telescope in my observatory, I should be able to follow it for most of the summer, but then I'll lose it, and even large telescopes will lose it in a few years. So I'm afraid now that regretfully, the time has come, almost, to say farewell to our most famous cosmic visitor. And frankly, I am very sorry to see it go. There's no doubt at all we've learnt more about comets in general from Halley's Comet this time round than we've been able to do throughout the whole of human history. The other spectacular this year was, of course, the Voyager 2 pass of the planet Uranus. And you may remember we did a program about that 
from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California. There's not a great deal to add. Uh, one more Uranian ring to add to the dark, rather narrow ring surrounding the planet. But I think the most spectacular results undoubtedly come from the satellites. And above all, the innermost of the previously known satellites, which is called Miranda, a strange little world only about 300 miles across. And just look at that close-range Voyager picture, that strange chevron in the middle, and to the lower left, what looks almost like a racetrack. It's an amazingly varied world. As I remember saying at the time, you name it, Miranda's got it. And just look at those cliffs. It's going to be a geologist's puzzle for many years. And, of course, the results from Voyager 2, as those from Giotto, are going to take a great many months to evaluate, so we haven't heard the last of them yet. But quite apart from the great triumphs of Voyager 2 and Giotto, obviously the first part of 1986 also brought that appalling tragedy with the shuttle. All our thoughts are still with the friends and relations of the astronauts who died. But quite apart from that, the damage to the American space program has been tremendous. For example, the Ulysses Solar Polar Probe. Well, that won't go. Then there was the Galileo Probe to Jupiter, made up of two parts, an entry probe to plunge into Jupiter's clouds and an orbiter to survey the satellites in more detail, including that weird sulfur-red volcanic world Io with its active volcanoes. We'd hope to gain a lot from that. Well, that certainly won't go. And then there is the Space Telescope, the Hubble 94-inch reflector scheduled to be put into a path round the Earth later on this year. And that now won't be launched in the foreseeable future. I'm not, of course, suggesting that these projects are going to be cancelled. We hope they won't be. But they are certainly going to be delayed. And just how long the delay is going to be is something we don't know, and we won't know until the shuttle problems are sorted out. But although the space telescope has been delayed, there's plenty going on with telescopes on Earth. And in particular, there's the completion of the great mirror for the Herschel reflector, which is British-built. In fact, the Herschel mirror was made at the Grubb Parsons Works in Newcastle. Very sadly, the last big mirror they'll make, because they are now closing their optical department, and in future, if we want a big telescope mirror, we have to shop around. But at least they're going out in a blaze of glory, because the Herschel mirror is going to be the third largest single mirror telescope in the entire world. It's going to be set up at the observatory on La Palma in the Canary Islands, and there's the dome which has been made ready for it. When we did our last program from La Palma, that dome hadn't been completed. Now it is, and it's waiting for the telescope. And already on La Palma, there is the INT, or Isaac Newton Telescope, taken there from Hurstman, sir, and given a new mirror. And you may remember that when we did a program from there, some time ago now, we got the first color video picture from beyond the solar system. And there it is, the Ring Nebula in Lyra, made up of a small hot star surrounded by an immense shell of gas. That was obtained during a commissioning run, and I think you'll agree it really is a rather spectacular picture. But you know, over the last few Sky at Night programs, I've been talking about either things you can't see very well, such as Halley's Comet, or couldn't see at all, such as Voyager. And I think the time has come now to have another of our looks round the sky. And there's plenty to be seen in the spring, even though we have lost Orion. And I thought we'd concentrate upon the two main spring constellations, Virgo the Virgin, and Leo the Lion. So let's begin by finding them, and nothing is easier. In fact, we've already done it by following round the tail of the Great Bear through Arcturus and coming to Spica, the leading star of Virgo. Virgo is one of the largest constellations in the sky. Not very bright, but quite distinctive. It's rather like an, a, a shape of a Y, and the star at the base of the Y is called Arich. There it is. And on the other side of the Y, we have Denebola, which belongs to the next door constellation, Leo the Lion. And Leo is actually rather more prominent than Virgo. It's named in honor of the Nemean Lion, which was one of Hercules' victims and killed during his famous labors. And there's an old picture of the Nemean Lion with a smaller lion on top. Frankly, in the sky, the lion is a great deal more prominent than Hercules himself. Leo is actually in the zodiac, and so planets can pass through it, although there aren't any planets there at the present time. Of the planets, Venus is just coming back into the evening sky, Jupiter rises a bit before dawn, and Mars and Saturn are quite nicely seen in the south in the early hours, although both will be better placed uh, later on this year. But Leo itself is quite distinctive. I think myself the best way to find it, if you're in any trouble at all, is to use the pointers in the Great Bear, Dupe and Merrick. Well, one way, that's above your screen, they show the way to the Pole Star. 
The other way, they come down and point in the direction of Leo, and I think once you've identified Leo, you'll find no trouble in finding it again. The main star, sometimes known as the royal star, is called Regulus, and that's of the first magnitude. And extending away from Regulus is a curved design of stars, rather like the mirror image of a question mark, known as the sickle. And the rest of Leo is made up mainly of a triangle of stars, of which the leader is De Nebula. Now let's look for a moment at two of the stars in the sickle. One is Regulus, 85 light years away, and about 130 sun power. Above Regulus is a much fainter star, which hasn't even got a proper name. It's simply known as Eta Leonis. And Eta Leonis looks very much fainter than Regulus. But appearances are highly deceptive. Eta Leonis is over 1,700 light years away, and it's something like 10,000 times more luminous than the sun. So if Eta Leonis was close to us of Regulus, it really would be a sight. In the triangle, we have another star, Zosma, or Delta Leonis, and that's 52 light years away and about 500 sun power. One rather interesting thing about those three, Regulus, Eta Leonis, and Zosma, light waves travel at 186,000 miles a second, and so we are seeing those stars as they used to be in the past. A regulus 85 years in the past and so on. Radio waves travel at the same speed as light. Now just imagine for a moment, there are people living in solar systems going around their stars, which can pick up our radio transmissions. Well, would they hear anything? From regulus, no. 85 years ago, our transmissions hadn't started. From Zosma, yes, they'd hear our transmissions of the 1930s. But from Eta Leonis, no chance at all. Uh, more than 1,700 light years away, and so for another 1,700 years, so far as they're concerned, uh, we are going to be radio quiet. That, of course, is pure fantasy. So let's come back now to reality and have a look at another star in the sickle, Algeba, or Gamma Leonis, which is just about as bright as the pole star. If you look at Algeba through a telescope, you will see it's not a single star. It's made up of two, forming what we call a binary system. And the brighter star is decidedly orange, cooler than the sun, but more powerful. And the fainter star is very slightly yellowish. And they make up a pair going around their common center of gravity in just over 400 years. And a small telescope will separate them, and they do make rather a nice sight. The other leading star of Leo is De Nebula in the triangle. And there's a very minor mystery there, because the astronomers of 2,000 years ago said quite definitely that De Nebula was of the first magnitude, and as bright as Regulus. Well, it certainly isn't now. It's a magnitude fainter. So there are only two answers. Either De Nebula has genuinely faded, or else there's been a mistake in interpretation or translation. I don't myself think anything has happened to De Nebula. It's a very stable kind of star. So probably there is an error in translation or interpretation. All the same, it is interesting, and it's not the only case. There are one or two other instances of stars which are now either considerably brighter or considerably fainter than the old astronomers said. I say it's rather interesting. Now, Leo, as I say, is in the zodiac. There are several galaxies in Leo. Galaxies, remember, being independent star systems, usually many millions of light years away. We live in a galaxy, our Milky Way galaxy, containing 100,000 billion stars. Now, the two brightest galaxies in Leo are called M65 and M66, and they're close to the faintest star in the triangle there, which we call Chort or Theta Leonis. I always think that galaxies are rather disappointing visually. To study them properly, you need photographs taken with large telescopes. And there's a picture of M65 and 66, and you can see they really are spiral systems. You can just about glimpse them with binoculars, but frankly, I find them rather difficult, and you'll only see them as blurred points of light. But if you want a constellation rich in galaxies, then you turn from Leo to the next door group, which is Virgo. And in the bowl of the Virgin, we find the Virgo cluster, which is very populous. Now, we've already found Spica, the leading star in Virgo, about 2,000 sun power, actually a very close binary. Look next at Erich at the base of the Y. And that also is a double star, but rather different from Algeba in Leo. Here, we have perfect stellar twins, two components exactly alike in every way, going round each other in a period of 180 years. Now, that's the drawing I made of them about 50 years ago with a small telescope. Of course, it's not a very good drawing because a star is a point of light, and I've had to draw them there as disks. But that's what they looked like, a very wide, very easy double. And I remember saying then, you could drive a coach and horses through the trap. Now, the situation today is not the same. 
Last night, I made a drawing of the same system, Erich, with the same telescope and the same eyepiece, and now the two stars are very much closer together. They are not really closer together. We are seeing them from a more edgewise on angle, and that's going to continue. Let me show you what I mean. Here we have the two stars going around their common central gravity in 180 years. If we go on in leaps of 10, 20 years, this is what happens. And now we're seeing them almost edgewise on, and by the year 2016, those two stars will be not quite one behind the other, but jolly nearly, and they'll be so close together that my telescope certainly won't separate them. And after that, they'll start to open out again. So Eris is a very interesting kind of double star. But certainly, in Virgo, the main interest is on the Virgo cluster in the bowl of the Y. And there are many hundreds of galaxies there, and there's a picture of some of them. And many of those blurred dots you can see are not actually stars, but are galaxies. Some of them containing 100,000 million suns, many of them larger and hotter than our own sun. And of the galaxies in the Virgo cluster, more than 50 million light years away, the most imposing is this one, Messier 87, which is a huge globular cluster, not a spiral like ours. If we see a false color picture, we can see there not only the structure, but also the strange jet coming out of one side of it. And M87 is also a very powerful radio source. I don't mean artificial transmissions, of course. I mean natural radio waves. It's also a source of X-rays. And there's another false color picture, this time taken from the Exosat satellite, showing the X radiation coming from M87. And it may well be that deep in the heart of that galaxy, there is a black hole which is actually powering it. Certainly, M87 is far more imposing than our own galaxy. And the Virgo cluster itself is very much more populous than the group of galaxies which includes our own. We live in a group of galaxies. We call it the local group. Our Milky Way system is one. Others are the Andromeda spiral. There it is, just over two million light years away, almost edge onto us. The rather looser spiral in Triangulum. Then we have the two clouds of Magellan and the Southern Hemisphere. They never rise from here, unfortunately. There's the larger cloud with the famous Tarantula Nebula to the left, and that's less than 200,000 light years away. And it and the small cloud of Magellan are both very easy naked eye objects. It may well be they can be regarded as satellites of our galaxy. But the entire local group is made up of something between 30 and 40 members, most of them fairly small. And so you cannot compare it possibly with the immensely populous Virgo cluster, where you have galaxies of all kinds, ranging from the huge M87 down to, no doubt, dwarf galaxies of the kind that we find in our own local group. And that's more than 50 million light years away. And this raises one very interesting point. Can it be that the Virgo cluster is simply the largest cluster of a whole cluster of clusters? A kind of super cluster, in, it, in fact. It may well be so. And there's now accumulating evidence that the Virgo cluster does have a very profound influence upon our local group. And it may well be that the Virgo cluster is even more important than we think. Bear in mind, too, that as yet, we still don't know a great deal about the large-scale structure of the universe, and that's where we very much hope that the Hubble telescope is going to help us when eventually it's launched. We've simply got to wait and see. But meanwhile, the Virgo cluster is of tremendous interest. And when you look at that area of the bowl of the Virgin, you're looking at one of the most interesting regions of the entire sky. The new newsletter is now ready. If you want it, then, as usual, send the stamped address envelope to this address. Newsletter number 21, The Sky at Night, BBC TV, London, W12, 8QT, and we'll send you our newsletter. And um, I think we'd agree that there is plenty of interest to be seen in the spring sky, even though, with great regret, we have now almost said farewell to Halley's Comet. Good night.